The government is promising schools greater freedom from the national curriculum and more flexibility in the choice of exams. So is it goodbye central prescription, hello professional autonomy, and how exactly is that going to work? What teachers tell us is that the IGCSE as a qualification does not meet the needs of the majority of their students. I personally believe that schools know best what's right for their students and the constraints of the national curriculum have limited us. What pupils aged 5 to 16 are taught and how they're tested have been set centrally ever since the national curriculum was created in 1988. But now the Education Secretary Michael Gove says he wants to give schools greater freedom. For several years now the compulsory core of the secondary curriculum has been slimmed down from the original 10 subjects plus religious education, particularly after the age of 14. The signs are that the coalition government wants to go further. The government has made this grand gesture that the curriculum's overblown, it's too regulated, they want teachers to have more professional autonomy. Where we have some nervous is what this slimmed down curriculum will look like. There are probably two broad ways that they could do it. You could say, let's take the existing national curriculum framework and slim down the requirements within that. You could say, let's pare the national curriculum down to a small number of core subjects and we will focus on prescription in those. My reading of what Michael Gove has said about the curriculum is that it's the second way that is the preferred way. So that means that we may be looking at pretty tight prescription in English, mathematics, science, and they've laid a great emphasis on history with very little prescription elsewhere. In Cambridge, Parkside Community School is a specialist school graded as outstanding by Ofsted. It's likely to seek academy status and the curriculum freedoms that go with that. Already it's been innovating with the curriculum, offering diplomas from age 14. It also plans to teach the International Baccalaureate post-16. In general terms, I mean, the government's talked about wanting to give more curriculum freedom to schools. Yeah. Uh, is that something that you welcome? I personally believe that schools know best what's right for their students and the constraints of the national curriculum have limited us and it's great that we can finally you know, move away in those areas we think it's appropriate to move away in. And as a core, the National Curriculum has served its purpose and served it well, but I think when you are achieving very well and the students are looking to do new things, we don't want to be held back in doing those. Parkside knows all about the constraints of the National Curriculum. Two years ago it started to offer the International GCSE as an option for some students in science. The choice was based on what it thought was best for pupils. Perhaps you could explain to us how, you, how it was that you first got interested in doing the IGCSE. Yes, I think it really came about because we were dissatisfied with the provision of separate sciences or even dual science run by OCR and ACWA. Essentially, governors were concerned, and a number of our governors are work in the university in science careers, that there was insufficient maths content and the sort of science that was being done wasn't a good preparation for further ed or higher ed. And so we looked around for what the opportunities might be and looked at the IGCSE and that did seem to offer many of the sort of aspects of science that we felt were lacking in the, tr in the courses that we were able at the time. But the school had to stop teaching the IGCSE when the last government refused to put the qualification on the approved list because it didn't map exactly with the national curriculum. Now I've got here magnesium and I've got here copper oxide. Science teacher Hannah Jones was disappointed the school stopped teaching the IGCSE but continues to feel it offers something better for pupils who want to continue with science post-16. I think it's because it's very um, good for going on and being a scientist in later life. It gives that proper foundation um, you, because of some of the things that you go through and some of the iterations that you do. In fact, you're, you're very well stood up for doing A-level or IB or whatever you're going to go on and do at, at sixth form and, and then on into tertiary level education. And what about the differences in the way it's examined? Does that mean it's not in modular units, is it, for example? Does it's that... not in modular units and it has quite a formal practical element to it. So there is the... Um, you can actually do a practical as an exam. So, I mean, broadly, from what I pick up from what you're saying, it's, it's really good for those who want to go on to be scientists, but may not be right for everybody else. Absolutely, yes. I don't think you would want to offer it to 100% of your students. Although the IGCSE is offered by English exam boards, until now it's mainly been used either abroad or by independent schools. 
But now the schools minister, Nick Gibb, has said the government is removing the red tape around IGCSEs and is approving them for funding in state-maintained schools. They'll now only need accreditation from Ofqual, which many have already received and should be on the approved list in time to be taught from September 2010. Parkside is keen to take up the new freedom. So now that the new government has said it's OK to go ahead with the IGCSE, what difference does that make to you? Well, we're going back to offering it to a selection of students. Um, from the, current, the students who are currently Year 9 who start their GCSE course next year, um, about a fifth of them will start on the IGCSE course. And finally, does this help put you on a more level playing field with, it, with independent schools? That was a consideration, and certainly within Cambridge there are a number of independent schools, some of whom were offering the IGCSE, and parents clearly felt that it was invidious that they should have to pay money to take a qualification that wasn't available in the state schools. IGCSEs are offered by Cambridge International Examinations and Edexcel. They differ from GCSEs because they are linear, not modular, so all assessment takes place at the end of the course, with exam papers covering the entire syllabus but some think it's a mistake to allow schools to offer the international version. What teachers tell us is that the IGCSE as a qualification does not meet the needs of the majority of their students. Those schools that do offer the IGCSE, I predict, will be schools with a privileged social intake. And what the IGCSE will become is a marker that if you go to this school, you're with very nice pupils from the middle classes. Um, it will become a marker of social selection for schools rather than any real um, academic uh, qualification which has real worth. The exam boards say the differences between the IGCSE and the national curriculum are minor and are mainly because some parts of the syllabus, such as covering Shakespeare in English, are optional. They say this can easily be fixed by making these areas compulsory. While IGCSEs have received a green light, the final group of diplomas has been scrapped by the government. The first ten diplomas in subject areas such as construction and media are already being taught in schools, and a further four covering travel and tourism, public services, retail business and sports and active leisure start in September 2010. But the schools minister Nick Gibb has announced that all development work on the final set of diplomas, the so-called academic diplomas covering science, languages and humanities, is being stopped. This will save £1.8 million now and more savings in the future. He said this would help refocus efforts on tried and tested rigorous qualifications in these subject areas. We know that the Phase 4 have gone. What, what, what sort of messages are we getting on diplomas? Do they still have a future? Our information is where it's being taught, uh, students and teachers and lecturers really like it and really value it. They think the structure is too complex and there are problems with progression, but in general terms, if you could sort those, uh, they do like that uh, qualification, they think it's worthwhile. The question is, how is it going to be funded? And will the funding uh, remain in place uh, to actually get diplomas off the ground? Because they are expensive. If the funding for diplomas is going to wither on the vine, so will the diplomas. The coalition government's policy is that the fate of diplomas will be decided by the market, so it has removed much of the additional funding they've been getting. It seems ministers prefer either out-and-out -out academic qualifications or purely practical and work-based courses like apprenticeships rather than the hybrid nature of diplomas. In the next episode of Need to Know, as we assess the impact of the government's spending plans, we'll be looking at the future funding of schools, including taking a look at what the proposed pupil premium will mean for school budgets. Music